I'm Matteo Rossetti. I've been at Zwift for two and a half years, where I helped establish the performance marketing function, or as we call it internally, our paid engine of growth. Zwift is a fitness company born from gaming. Our product is a software or a game that makes boring indoor training for cyclists and runners a fun and sociable experience. So nowadays I lead the Zwift in-house performance marketing team and I have a specific focus on driving cost-efficient customer acquisition. Part of my role is also helping to unveil the effectiveness and the incrementality of paid media for this young and innovative business. Uh, prior to this, I activated and coordinated a variety of digital channels for global multinational companies. I'm Fabio Angeli Bufalini. Uh, I'm the chief marketing officer at Vino.com. I'm in the digital marketing sector since 15 years. Uh, previously, I worked for uh, uh, the travel industry and consultancy, then moving on the online gaming brands like PokerStars, Party Gaming, uh, and Betson, where I launched all the marketing operations. Uh, I'm now proud to be with Vino.com. Uh, we are a leading marketing web website on the wine business here in Italy. Uh, we launched the business in 2014 in Italy, and then we launched also in China in 2017. Uh, we kicked off also our operations in Germany, Netherlands, and Belgium last year. And this year we are planning to launch all the other European strategic markets. Thank you both so much for taking your time to, uh, to join us today, uh, Fabio uh, and Matteo. And it, it's interesting right from the word go to hear that you've both kind of been on the consultancy side as well as the, uh, as well as the business owner side, so to speak. Now, you're obviously both passionate about your businesses and that comes through and that's obviously fundamental for any kind of business success. But in terms of international business success, can I ask first, uh, why initially you decided to uh, expand abroad? Maybe Fabio, can I ask you first? Yes, yeah, sure, Ruben. Um, after uh, our successful experience in the Italian market, we've seen a huge potential to expand globally. So uh, leveraging also the e-commerce economies at scale that we had. So this was quite a natural uh, looking forward uh, action in order to become the global online shop for Italian wine. So that's our main goal. I, I, I love that ambition of the global, uh, uh, the global shop for, uh, for Italian wine. And, you know, the fact that you've gone to China, to Germany, and your, your expansion is, is ever increasing speaks, I think, to something we've heard a lot about in previous episodes uh, in that the, the digital state of play means that, that geographic boundaries are becoming less of a challenge, shall we say, to businesses. Um, Matteo, coming to you, your business model is, is considerably different from, uh, from Fabio's. I'm guessing that globalization was always on the cards for Zwift. That's right, Ruben. Essentially, Zwift sells subscription to our proprietary software, the game. Uh, so for us, distribution has always been global. Internationalization for us has a specific meaning. Uh, it means choosing and prioritizing what markets we're going to be most effective at um, where we deploy our marketing and our paid media. Um, so we have a global ambition and a global reach, but obviously in a world of limited budgets and time and resources, you need to make your shots count and you need to invest where you're most likely to get significant returns. Oh, that's really interesting you say that, Matteo, because we started our Think Global journey with a conversation with Zani from The Economist uh, looking at the wider global economy to do exactly that, to help us focus a little bit on exactly which markets uh, had the most opportunity for international growth. How do you plan where to focus your international ambition? So it's a combination of three factors. 
The first factor is strategic importance. And by this, we mean in what countries do we need a strong foothold to help establish a new category of indoor cycling? So this is likely a unique challenge for brands that are pioneer in their category. However, just like any other business, it also means that we need to balance the cost of acquiring a customer in that uh, specific area of the world and also the projected lifetime value of customers from that market. The second factor is the size of the addressable market. So by this, I mean, where is cycling interest the highest and where is the indoor training solution going to be most appealing? So Google's data helped us analyze the maturity of different markets and determine not only where the demand is the highest now, but also where we can see similar interest existing that indicate that the ground is fertile and there's a good opportunity for us to expand that market in the near future and help grow the demand for the category. Uh, anyone listening today can uh, access that knowledge by either asking their Google reps or using the free online tool that is called Market Finder. Uh, we then coupled that, um, that data with internal survey data that we have to understand the motivations behind um, the choices of our users. Uh, in some areas, people cycle indoor because of weather conditions, because of safety concerns, because of time convenience. And we map the growth opportunities um, to the best creative approach and messaging in our marketing. The third factor is what I call the availability of localized assets. For us, that means having a localized game, a localized website, customer support, advertising, payment methods. So we are careful to balance the projected returns from one country with the efforts that is required to localize the game, the website, and everything that I have mentioned. That's a great answer, Matteo. Thank you. And I, and I love that that three-step process is, is really clear. And also, I like the way you kind of combined your own audience knowledge and first-party data with, with tools like Google Market Finder there. Um, Fabio, has your experience been similar in terms of focusing on which markets to export Vino.com into? I completely agree with Matteo point of view. Um, all points are very important, but I would like also to suggest other elements to consider when you enter a market. So in our case, uh, it's very important integration with taxis, local custom. So that's a critical factor that we have really to consider when we enter in a market. In, on top of that, of course, there are, uh, we analyze all the market insight. No? So we see uh, where the market aspect can be important in order to make a scorecard of the global uh, countries. Uh, so we analyze uh, local uh, GDP, uh, interpenetration, consumer behavior. All these kind of aspects are very critical. But at the same time, thanks also to Google Market Finder, we are able to see better uh, the, the, our KPI and make a forecast about that. So they can, this can help us to, to see the average CPC that we are looking for, the customer acquisition cost, the conversion rate optimization, and then also the average order value. All these factors are critical when we decide to enter a market. Well, that's really interesting stuff, both of you. Thank you so much. And, I, and Fabio, that, that idea of a scorecard is something that, again, we, we, we touched upon with Zanny in, in episode one. Um, gentlemen, if I may be slightly cheeky now and ask you for what plans you have coming up in the, uh, in the international space. Uh, we are at the start now of, of 2021. Can I ask you, uh, maybe Fabio first, what are your plans for uh, continued international expansion over the course of the next year? Yes, Ruben, thanks, thanks for the question. So um, this year, our main goal is to enter in the main European markets like France, Spain, Sweden, Denmark, Austria and Ireland. So it's a, a very very tough goal, but we are we want really to, to do that. And the timing for this goal will be always related, as I said before, in our case, connected with the integration with the taxis custom. That's that's critical for us. At the same time, we are looking for a special events that are critical in this sector, like Black Fridays, single days, 
Cyber Monday, Christmas time, these all uh, timing of the year are very important for us in order to continue to push in communication and replicate what we have done uh, in our country, uh, replicate this in, in the new markets. Uh, that's really interesting. And I, I'm going to uh, go back to the, the replication piece a little bit later on, if I may, Fabio. Uh, Matteo, coming to you, what's the, the, the year looking ahead looking like for you? Is it a case of consolidation or is it further growth? Yeah, 2020 has been a year of very strong growth for us across all our main markets. But it was also an opportunity to start noticing a few new emerging ones, uh, which we are now planning to bring into the list of key countries where we, uh, we focus on. So this means bringing the new GUs up to speed in all the departments with the key markets. Uh, that means support growing communities, create local events with recognizable local teams and cycling heroes, uh, translating web content, advertising, customer service, uh, payment methods, and, and everything. Uh, the idea really is to level up the focus of those countries with the other priority uh, geos. So 2020 will be about consolidating our strong presence in North America, uh, Northern Europe, and Japan, and continue to grow and support the communities in those uh, emerging countries as well. So to your point, uh, this isn't necessarily this, this, this increase in e-commerce, this increased digitization of the world isn't something that just happened because of the pandemic, but it's, it's something you see having a, a long term, uh, having a long term effect on consumer behaviors. Now, interestingly, you both spoke about um, uh, you both spoke about customer experiences through through COVID, and and Fabio, you there, you touched upon you know supporting your suppliers through that, which kind of brings us on to my next question about operations, about being set up to be able to grow internationally. Um, throughout the Think Global series, we've heard from from pretty much all of our experts the importance. Uh, the important role rather that business operations plays in our ability to expand internationally. I wonder, um, starting with, with yourself, Matteo, what which to you are the most important parts of, of or the most important elements, sorry, of business operations when it comes to being able to grow successfully internationally? Stripping it back to basics, we sell an experience. We make boring training fun. So removing the pain points and potential for friction is really on brand for us. Um, I would love to tell you that there is one aspect in isolation that is key to success when you go international, but instead I'll argue that it all deserves equal attention. As with, we try to address all parts of localization in parallel. When we pick a market to be a focus, uh, it qualifies for the full package. We give localized website, translated ads in locally relevant content, a translated support section on the website, locally adequate payment method, methods, um, but also in-game partnerships and activations that are relevant to that market. So you're really leaving yourself short, I think, if you go in with a half-baked approach. Um, I invite anyone to ask themselves, can my localized advertising really work hard if I don't offer the payment methods that are relevant to my customers that they know and trust? Or am I giving my localized website, for example, the best chances if my customer service team can only answer questions in English? So obviously this makes the rollout of, uh, acti of activities into any new country a considerable effort in both time and resources. But so far, we seem to really be getting it right. So to give you a measure of what success looks like, um, by moving France out of the European cluster um, that we had last year, and by dedicating all our efforts, as just described, it only took one year for it to become a market of comparable size to the other strong consolidated markets. So yes, we do put a lot of effort in going into a new geo, but also think of the rewards. Creating a whole tier one market in just 12 months, I think definitely pays back for the hard work. That was a, a great response, Matteo. Thank you so much. And I, and I, and I love that, that you know, where you ended that with, that 
that honesty that yes, it's hard work, but absolutely it pays off. Um, along the same lines, Fabio, you know, we've talked a little bit about how important customer experience is. And, and, and we heard in previous episodes the importance of things like fast delivery when it comes to um, when it comes to successful international growth. Is that something that you've found uh, uh, critical for your own growth? Many aspects are critical and important along uh, the entire customer journey. Um, basically, in our situation, we deliver in 48 hours, and that's very important. And the customer has also a virtual sommelier that can help to, to assist and uh, all in the, the buying process of the customer. Uh, but to support our internationalization, uh, what is very important for us is uh, localization. So we strongly believe that is critical factor. You cannot only translate the website. You need to be to think with the culture and the country uses and the consumer behavior that or the local consumer behavior. This is a part and be part of the local culture in order to give the right message to the customer and get credibility. This is totally crucial for us. And this will be always part of our uh, activity when we enter a new market. So our goal is to think global and finally act local. So that, that's very important for us. Um, Matteo, you said yourself you had a strong 2020. And, and actually that inspires me to ask both of you a little bit how you found your international growth uh, plans affected, if indeed they were, by the by the recent pandemic. So, first of all, Matteo, if I could come back to you, were there from a from an organisation or a business point of view, were there any challenges that you experienced uh, during the pandemic that that had any effect on your uh, on your international growth? Yes, as as a brand that offers indoor training solutions, uh, we felt that we were well positioned to serve a rapidly changing world in 2020. At first, we were worried that the incredible increase in demand would have not translated in long-term business growth. Uh, as factories started to close, then it quickly became very hard to uh, buy bicycles, trainers, components of any kind. Um, so we chose to take a risk, really, and put the customers first. Um, this meant we still scaled our advertising to match the increase in demand. We created more in-game events to serve the community. And we had around-the-clock technical improvements to servers, games, software, and everything to basically guarantee a smooth experience to all our new customers. And looking back, this was absolutely the right decision. The slowdown in acquisition did not materialize, and the vast majority of the new customers that we acquired during that, uh, the initial uh, months of the pandemics and the lockdown actually stuck around for the entire season, even after the restrictions were lifted. Fascinating stuff. And uh, the point you make there about your, you know, the, the passion that your, you know, the, the, the staff and the employees and Swift has generally for the uh, uh you know, for what it does uh it helped you through those challenges and that that speaks to a culture piece that we we touched upon with les Binette in uh, in episode three um fabio did you experience something similar in terms of not necessarily seeing consumer demand fall off even as lockdown started to ease in in different countries and in different markets it sounds strange, but COVID-19 didn't represent a challenge for us uh, when we decided to go international. Uh, lockdown and uh, all the restriction uh, boosted all the e-commerce business and home delivery. And Vino.com was uh, perfect uh, on this situation to support all these increasing needs. At the same time, we helped a lot, uh, all the wine producers, to continue their business in this difficult timing. Um, same time, I can say that also in our view, this is not only a pandemic situation in our situation, uh, because we have seen also last summer when uh, the, 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 the situation was less strict, we continue to see an increase in our growth also during this timing. So we are quite sure that this, uh, this growth will continue after the pandemic, that's for sure. 
I, I, I mentioned that we, we touched upon this idea of culture and how important culture was in terms of growing internationally with Les Binet in, in episode three. And actually, that conversation we had with Les also talked a lot about marketing strategy and about choosing the right strategy for entering and then growing in new markets. We talked about getting the weighting right between uh, performance or direct response marketing uh, and brand. Uh, Matteo, if I could go to you first, um, what's uh, how do you see your uh, marketing strategies being weighted? Is it more towards brand or more towards direct response and, and, and performance work? Our split between brand and direct response is more skewed towards the former. This is because as a brand that is pioneering a new category in what is basically 150 years old sports, our biggest challenge is driving interest and under understanding. So investing in the top funnel has a long and short term value for us. In the short term, it creates uh, and stimulates demand that we can pick up with our direct response for easy conversion, driving short-term revenue. And in the long term, it also contributes to stabilize and grow in our brand and make it less susceptible to seasonal demand and consolidating our presence in the endemic space. Yeah, no, that, that, and again, that resonates hugely with what we heard from Les in terms of, you know, taking a short-term and a long-term approach to marketing. Now, interestingly, Fabio, your sector, your your space, if you will, isn't isn't new in the same way that Matteo's is. So, for you, is it more a case of direct response and performance work that drives your international expansion? Yes, Ruben, absolutely, that that's correct. When we launch market, we start always with all the digital channels based on pure performance uh, target. So we used to all the tools like search engine marketing, retargeting, affiliates, socials, uh, taking also into consideration the growth, uh, the growth of all the organic traffic. Uh, at the same time, we start to build a brand with the tactical and more strong above the line actions in order to, to establish the brand. But always we don't forget that we are digital and our main focus will continue to be digital uh, because that's our nature, absolutely. Makes an, an awful lot of sense, Fabio. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, thank you both for all of the insights you've offered so far. And actually, again, I'm going to be a little bit cheeky for my final question, if I may. Uh, and actually, quite tactical. You know, we're speaking to business and marketing leaders who are are looking to expand internationally. So, very simply, my last question is: Which products and tools have you personally found? most valuable when it comes to driving international growth and uh, if i could start with with yourself fabio yeah sure our approach uh, and, and and naturally are fully digital uh, we believe in automation we use a smart bidding looking to increase uh, our reach and quality score uh, same time also the all the shopping ads dynamic ads retargeting uh, then, of course, we, we mix all these factors with also the social activities. Um, in addition with that, we implement also the action that can help us to, to be the brand, as I said before, uh, always looking uh, to, 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 to get the goal, uh, the final goal to get credibility in the country. So influencer marketing, TV ads, but everything has to be with a clear call to action, looking to get the right ROI of the action, finally. So the, the final goal is to get a put chase on the website. So basically, finally, we are really always an online wide shop. That's, that's always something that we don't have to forget. Brilliant insight, Fabio. Thank you very much. And it's interesting, your, your, your piece there about automation, uh, you know, and, and the role that plays in, in being able to replicate campaigns and, and, and objectives across markets was, was kind of something I, I, I wanted to touch upon from your response earlier. Um, Matteo, finally to yourself, what, what levers have you found most valuable when it comes to your own international experiences? Yeah, I'll start with the direct response side of things, which is more of my focus. Uh, the paid search in general is a really powerful and efficient way to deliver customer acquisition. Um, and also, it's usually the easiest to, to track. We recently embarked a number of projects that aimed at demonstrating the incrementality of that activity. This means we can then confidently report back to the business 
and show that any investment that goes in that direction contributes to business growth uh, beyond that. On the other end of the funnel, uh, in the upper funnel, I have to say that TV and online video have also been really great channel for us. At the same time, they enable us to reach um, large audiences, but also establish our legitimacy as one of the big brands in the cycling space. I can't thank Fabio and Matteo enough for their honesty and all of the insights that they've shared. Loads to reflect on there, I think, and importantly, loads we can action when it comes to our own international growth plans. Now, whilst this is the final episode in this particular series of Think Global, I'd like to think it's actually just the start of the most exciting part of your journey. Thanks to all of the insight, the research and the advice we've received from Matteo, from Fabio and indeed all of our thought leaders, I reckon we're in a pretty good position to make the most of digital and join those companies like Zwift and Vino.com who are already thriving in international markets. And it's not a journey we need to make alone. As well as all of the tools that we've discussed across the episodes, tools for instance like Google Market Finder, don't forget at any stage in our journey we can reach out to our Google points of contact to ask for their advice and their support. In fact, do let us know what support you'd find most valuable by filling in our survey. And with that, I will simply say thank you so much for joining us across all of these episodes. And again, thank you for continuing to think global. See you soon.